Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our study of the Bhakti by Bhav uh, Kapila Shiksha, right? We're on the third canto, chapter number 27 today. Is everyone okay about chapter 26? Did you look over it? Any questions? Anything you remember? Hey, uh, Maharaj, we spoke about that we need to be free from uh, passion and ignorance and uh, we want to be fr free from the lower modes and come to the transcendental platform. So we need to practice our chanting and our devotion service uh, very intensely and very regularly. That's oh. one point. Okay, thank you Prabhu, very good, yes. This, that point comes up today also in relation to the, tech, the chapter today. The intensity and determination and practice. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Actually, uh, Maharaj, I have a few queries, if you may kindly permit, may I ask? Please. Regarding the chapter 26. Uh huh. Actually, uh, there is one, uh, uh, one uh, text number 32. Uh, it is basically mentioning the potency of sound, which is relation to bondage and liberation. So liberation, I understood that when we uh, chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, it is the spiritual sound. So we are basically in the liberated stage. But I could not understand how the potency of sound is basically creating bondage for us. Well, it can. It can create bondage. Depends on the sound, right? There are different sound vibrations. So it depends on the, what kind of sound vibration you're... you're what, what, are, what are the sounds you're vibrating? They will have different effects. There's an experiment, there was an experiment done by one Japanese scientist. He was investigating the effects of sound on different uh, structures or molecular structures and uh, re I, I can send you the the results of the guy's research there is something yeah uh, basically uh, I, I would appreciate uh, your kind guidance in this regard and uh, in the text it mentions that sound is the original uh, original entity through which the material bondage is created uh, so, and from sound, ether is created. So that that is mentioned in text number 32, but how the sound creates material bondage for living entities that I am unable to appreciate, Maharaj. Well, you can understand how people become very attached to, to sweet sounds, right? They like their singing. <laughs> the donkey even likes the sound of its own braying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Maharaj. It's a sound. Uh, even the Christian Bible said, there's a statement in the Christian Bible said, in the beginning was the Word. And when Prabhupada heard that, he said, yes, he said, this is our philosophy. He said, we agree with that. He said, everything comes from sound. Sound is the finest element. 
And it's the beginning of the creation of the elements. As you said, first element is ether. But the ether comes about with the sound. There's nothing else. There's only sound. It's the beginning of the creation. So the sound creates bondage. The, the, we become captivated by different sounds. Just like the deer. When people go hunting, they will, they will play the, the sound of the flute. And the deer will hear the sound of the flute and become stunned. And in this way that the animal can be killed. The hunters, the, the, the deer is usually running fast and difficult to shoot. But when they hear the sound of the flute, they become stunned. They become controlled and captivated by the sound. And so we see that example in nature, how sound is a bondage. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, sorry, I actually have a presentation from Iskand Zayatri uh, regarding what Maharaj was speaking about earlier from the Japanese person and also the scientific test done by Florida State University in America regarding sound and chanting of Hare Krishna. So if anyone wants, if they could send me the email address, I can forward that uh, presentation on the Iskand Desire Tree. Oh, very good, yeah. Thank you. Yes, the, so the quality of the sound will, uh, it, you know, the, just like everything is influenced by the modes of nature, so there is transcendental sound, and then there's sounds in goodness, sound in passion, sound in ignorance. How we distinguish Maharaj the different modes with respect to sound? The qualities of the sound. There will be quality, different natures will be expressed through the sound. You know, some, yes, some sounds are very soothing and pleasing and relaxing. You know, there's even a, there's a whole therapy which they do for curing diseases just by hearing sounds different sounds, meditational sounds, you know, you hear sounds of nature, sounds of running water, you hear the sound of the seashore, and some of these things, people like to meditate on all these different sounds, who have different effects. At the same time, you have people in an angry mood, and they're yelling and screaming at each other, certainly the sound will create a very different mood. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. What's your other, co other question? Yeah. Uh, another question is regarding, uh, there is one phrase in text number three, Anadir Atma Purusho, basically which is, which is signifying that Supreme Lord is not having any beginning. He is the beginningless uh, uh, entity. And uh, how we can use in preaching, like we have to tell that uh, there is a relation between the Supreme Lord and living entity and living entity is just a part and parcel, uh, which is basically uh, the constitutional position of serving uh, the Lord eternal. So is that uh, to be used for preaching, like the statement which signifies Anadir Atma Purusho, that Supreme Lord is beginningless? Yes, we are also beginningless for so the soul. How, how do we how do we basically uh, use this kind of thing for preaching? That the Lord has no beginning? The soul, the Supreme Lord has, is without beginning? Yes, Maharaj. Well, how do we use it for preaching? You have, we have to get them first of all to, you have to make sure that they're understanding that there is a Supreme Lord, there is a person behind the creation. Yes, Maharaj. Creation means a creator. So who is that creator? That person who is not created by anyone else. The ultimate creator, the original person. Nobody is responsible for his creation. He himself is behind everything. Basically, the supreme creator and supreme controller of everything which exists in the material creation. Yes. So, people should accept that there is there is God. There is someone behind the world. It's not just the the world came about by chance. 
We don't believe in chance. We don't believe that it just came about from chemicals. We don't believe the world just came out of the black hole somewhere or fell out of a white hole or whatever uh, Stephen Hawkins and people like that say. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Is that it? Any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj Ji. Hare Krishna. I pay my audiences onto your lotus feet. Please pardon me. I am unable to switch on my camera. I think so. Okay. Uh, what struck? One thing which struck me in this chapter was that one becomes joyful when discharging devotional service, and in that devotional, uh, sorry, joyful attitude, one can understand the signs of God or Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, it is not possible. This is what struck me. Thank you, Maharaj. So, there's no question. Just you were just reading a quote for us. Yes, yes, ma'am. This uh, this one thing which struck me in this chapter. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. We want to go on to the next chapter. Let me see. Here's the PowerPoint. Are you able to see it? Okay. Yes, my right. No good. No. Okay. Understanding Material Nature, Chapter 27 Connection with previous chapter Having, ex having explained the categories of the Saguna Brahman Who would like to explain what is Saguna Brahman? Do you remember? Hare Krishna. Yes? Brahman, uh, including the three mode of natures, Satagun, Rajagun, and Tamun. Okay. So, Brahman with qualities. Yes. So, Kapila concluded the last chapter recommending that we should get free from material affection through devotion, detachment, advancement in spiritual knowledge, and contemplation of the Super Soul. Next, Kapila will elaborate on the process of Sankhya, which reinstates the soul in its original position. All right, so this is a connection with the previous chapter. We'd heard about the last chapter. Lord Kapila was recommending giving up material affection, cultivating devotion, all, all of these things and cultivating spiritual knowledge, meditation on the super soul, it's all going to be described. Super soul we'll get in the next chapter, we'll hear about that more tomorrow. But the idea is detachment should be there, material detachment, renunciation, devotion. They all come about with devotion. By devotion or service we automatically get detached from material nature. Here's the overview of the chapter. Right. First, the first nine verses describing the original consciousness of the living entity and how we can revive it. <laughs> We've lost our original consciousness due to the material nature. And then the chapter goes on to the awareness of a liberated soul. What, what should be the actual consciousness of the liberated soul? And then chapters, verses 17 to 20, we'll hear Devahuri's questions. She's got some nice inquiries. She wants to understand how the soul can become free from material influence. And then the rest of the chapter, it's not a very big chapter this time, only some 30 verses, uh, Lord Kapila will confirm the importance of very serious practice, practicing very seriously, very strictly, very regularly. All right, so that's the breakdown of the chapter. It begins with 
the original consciousness of the living entity in the process to revive it. Oh, that's text number five. Maybe we should go back and we'll read the first five verses. Let me finish this. And we'll go back to the text. All right, here's the first text. Who would like to read the first verse for us? The personality of Godhead will continue. The living entity is thus unaffected by the modes of material nature. Because he is unchanging and does not claim proprietorship, he remains apart from the reactions of the modes. Although abiding in a material body, just as the sun remains aloof from its reflection on... On water. On, on water. Yeah. You see the word water at oh, the top? Um, oh, yeah. Okay, now I see it. Okay. So, would you like to summarize something? Tell us something. What do you understand from this verse? Lord Kapila is explaining the living entity when he's unaffected by the modes of nature. So unaffected by the that means he's actually come to the liberated platform. He's on the liberated platform. Because he's unaffected because he is unchanging and he does not claim proprietorship. So that's a very good thing. You can see we can see qualities of the liberated soul doesn't claim proprietorship over anything he remains so he remains apart from the reactions of the modes although he's living in a material body and Lord Kapila gives the example just like the Sun remains aloof from the reflection on water so the Sun is reflected on water the water may have big waves and so on it may be very disturbed but the sun is never disturbed. The reflection of the sun is not going to be disturbed. So the same way, the devotee is living in the material world, but he can be liberated even though he's in the material world, material body, right? There's some... Yes? Uh, yes, Maharaj, so shall I say one thing in this one? In yes, this please, one? please, yeah. yeah. Actually, in this one, uh, Srila Prabhupada has mentioned in the uh, purport that when one uh, does uh, something for himself at his own risk, he, he is basically claiming proprietorship. And when he does everything for Krishna, then there is no risk of uh, claiming proprietorship or there is no reaction. Because mm -hmm. if he is doing everything for Krishna, then he is uh, aloof from the modes. Well, yes, right. Any verse, relevant verse you can give us? What is the example we get in the Bhagavad Gita? Devi hai aisha gurmai mamaya gurutaya. Okay. I, w I was thinking that example where Krishna speaks about the lotus flower, that it sits on the water and not in the water. And, yes, Maharaj. And so it doesn't get affected. So we, we should, the, the yogi is like that, devotee is like that. Although he's in the material world, he's not caught up in the material world. He's not identifying with it. He's not trying to enjoy it. Okay, we'll go ahead. Second verse, someone read. When the soul is under the spell of material nature and false ego, identifying his body as the self, he becomes absorbed in material activities and by the influence of false ego, he thinks that he is the proprietor of everything. All right, so this is the problem. We think we're the proprietor. Prabhupada writes here, I've marked in the purport, this false sense of proprietorship can be avoided simply by engaging oneself in devotional service under the direction of the Supreme Lord or his bona fide representative. And Prabhupada gives the example about Arjuna. In the Bhagavad Gita, 
how, how did Arjuna apply this point? How did he give up proprietorship? Maharaj, uh, may I say that? Can I? Uh, like he did what uh, the Lord told him to do. He didn't. Yes. He obeyed, obeyed what? Uh, like the Lord told him to fight, so he fought. Right. He followed Krishna's instructions. Yeah. He was thinking he didn't want to fight. Yes. Yeah. So he was thinking himself, he was thinking he was the proprietor. He was thinking he was the doer. But Lord Krishna told him, no, you just do what I tell you. He, and that way, by following Krishna's instruction, he got freed from any reaction. The end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, a conditioned soul may be very good and act in the mode of goodness, but still he is conditioned under the spell of material nature. A devotee, however, acts completely under the direction of the Lord. Thus, his actions may not appear to be of very high quality to the common man, but the devotee has no responsibility. <laughs> so, what's, what the is, what's the point Prabhupada is making here? His actions may appear not to be very good, not very high quality. Who is he talking about? A devotee. Yeah, he may be talking about even Arjuna. We may say it's not very good, Arjuna is fighting. He's going to kill so many people. It's not very good. <laughs> you know, people think like that. They see everything in material way, you know. They don't see it on a spiritual platform. But the devotee, he, he, he just understands what does Krishna want. He does everything for service to Krishna. He's not thinking of his own self. So this is the idea. The devotee, he just acts under the direction of the Supreme Lord. Though we do what Krishna wants. You can't listen to all these other people. Well, oh, that's not good. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, no, no. We have to do what Krishna wants. <laughs> Now, maybe you remember that there was a, there's a famous devotee in Prabhupada's time. His name was Vishnu Jana Swami. Vishnu Jana Swami. He's very famous. He was a wonderful kirtanier. He was actually a, actually a musician. And he, and he sang wonderfully. He was really wonderful. Played the, played uh, harmonium very, very nicely and played madanga also. And he, he did a lot of kirtan. A really wonderful curtainer, and uh, <laughs> he used to have a bus. He was the originator of the Radha Damodar party. He was on his own before Tamal Krishna Maharaj joined him. So he had a bus, and he was driving his bus, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, sometimes he would do things like he'd just go through the red lights, and he wouldn't care. And devotees would say, oh, Vishnu Jan Swami, oh, Vishnu Jan Maharaj, you went through the red light. And he would just say, we are not under the laws of Kamsa. <laughs> that was his thinking, you know. <laughs> he said, we are not under the laws of Kamsa. He was concerned that we have to serve Krishna. We don't care about Kamsa. Very interesting. Oh, let's go ahead. Text number three. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, regarding um, verse number one, uh, we spoke about, you know, you want the liberated platform. So you situated in your original consciousness. Now, when we uh, attain that platform, actually, Prabhupada in his latter years, he was still translating Srimad Bhagavatam, especially in the final few months, yet his body wasn't able to function normally. So now when you reach that liberated platform and you're in your original consciousness, although there may be defects of the body, uh, do you feel that or are you completely detached from that situation? Well, we understand you do feel it. You know, Prabhupada was aware of his bodily condition 
and he, you know, he would try to adjust the bodily situation. He would try, he was trying different doctors and different, some different medicines. He tried even the approach, he had devotee go to an astrologer hmm, and see what the astrologers say, you know, just out of interest. But then Prabhupada would come to the conclusion, he said, the real medicine is Krishna consciousness. And he said, the real medicine is a holy name. And he, under, he, he took that as the real medicine, took the shelter of the holy name. He just wanted more kirtan, more kirtan. So constant kirtan was going on for him all the time. And he was, that's what he, he saw as the real medicine. He didn't worry about, you know, he tried a few things, tried some, men, you know, nothing really was very successful. He wasn't really very convinced about the different doctors and their treatments. And he didn't want to go to Western medicine also. He was working mainly with Ayurveda, some Ayurvedic doctors. So he was aware of his physical situation, yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, going ahead, text number, number three, yeah. Okay. Read. Uh, the conditioned soul, therefore, transmigrates into different species of life, higher and lower, because of his association with the modes of material nature. Unless he is relieved of material activities, he has to accept this position because of his faulty work. Hare Krishna. All right. So conditioned souls moving in different bodies because of association with the modes of nature. He has to accept this condition. Not very pleasant, but what can he, what can be done? Prabhupada explains in the purport <laughs> to take birth in a nice place or a high family does not mean that one avoids undergoing the material tribulations, the pangs of birth, death, old age, and disease. A conditioned soul under the spell of material nature, cannot understand that any action he performs for sense gratification is faulty, and that only his activities in devotional service to the Lord can give him re release from the actions of faulty activities. And so people have their own ideas about this material world and you know, they, they, they dream, they, they think being good. And we sometimes look at other people and we think, oh, they're not suffering much. Oh, they've got a nice house. Oh, they've got that big car. Oh, they've got money. Oh, they're so well, well situated. They must be happy, comfortable. But they're suffering as well. We should understand everyone's suffering this material world, conditioned souls. They're all under the modes of material nature. And Prabhupada talks that up here, the foolish conditioned soul may think. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, internet problem here. Can you unmute, unmute me? Recording in progress. Yeah. The host disabled participants screen sharing. Okay, Chandrika Mataji has become co host. So, how do I share the screen? Yeah, now you... you Thank you.
Okay, where were we? Oh, yeah. We were on the text, right? Text number three, Maharaj. Yes. Part, part. All right. We were hearing about the conditioned soul, that he has to accept different conditions of life. He's always under the modes of nature. We'll go ahead. Text number four. Someone read. Actually, the living entity. Living entity is transcendental to the material existence, but because of his mentality of lording over it over material nature, his material nature existential condition does not cease, and just as a dream, he is affected by all sorts of disadvantages. Okay, so material world is described like that, just like a dream. And he's affected by all kinds of disadvantages, material anxieties. So this is the problem. Conditioned existence is all based on sense gratification. And sense gratification is a great struggle. Very temporary, flickery, very short-lived, but we, people will struggle so hard just to get some sense gratification. They never want to give up their positions in the material world. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, our real friend is Krishna and we have to make friends with Krishna. We're trying to make so many, we're trying to put ourselves in the center of everything. We think we're the friend of everyone, but actually it's Krishna who's our friend. And if we don't make friendships with Lord Krishna, then we'll never be happy. We'll never find peace of mind. We'll never find success in our life. Going ahead, text number five, an important verse. Someone read text five. It is the duty of every conditioned soul to engage his polluted consciousness, which is now attached to material enjoyment in very serious devotional service with detachment. Thus his mind and consciousness will be under full control. Yes. Okay, so this is, a, this is how we should do our devotional service. Conditioned souls, we're all conditioned, we have to, in, and our consciousness is polluted because we're attached to material enjoyment and the cure for the disease the cure for the, con for the uh, pollution, we have to do very serious devotional service. My, using our mind and consciousness under full control. Right? So we'll go back. I have this on the PowerPoint here. Oh, not that one. Okay, here's a quote from text number five, right? This is the verse, and here's from the purport. Someone read? It is there for the... It is there for... It is therefore recommended in this verse that one engage very seriously in the devotional service of the Lord. This means that one should not think that he is the proprietor, benefactor, friend, or enjoyer. He should always be cognizant that the real enjoyer is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the basic principle of Bhakti Yoga. Yes, wait, there's a bit more. Yes, go ahead. One must be real humility and compassion. One must be firmly convinced of the three principles. One should always think that Krishna is the proprietor, Krishna is the enjoyer, and Krishna is the friend. Not only should he understand these principles himself, but he should try to convince others and 
Yes, right. Try to understand this himself and then try to convince others. And in this way you can distribute, give Krishna consciousness to others. So very important. We have to be convinced. Krishna is the enjoyer. Our position is to be enjoyed. We're Krishna's energy. He's the energetic. So our position is to be enjoyed in the service of Krishna. And Krishna is the proprietor. Krishna is the enjoyer. Krishna is the friend, the best friend. We, we want to develop our friendship with Krishna. And that means following Krishna's instructions and being familiar to know what Krishna's teachings are. So the problem is, of course, our mind, that we have to control our mind. So we ask, how can we purify our mind so that we can accomplish that order? We want to make friends with Krishna, we have to steady our mind. So, text 6 describes, one has to become faithful by practicing the controlling process of the yoga system and must elevate himself to the platform of unallied devotional service by chanting and hearing about me. So this is Lord Kapila's instructions to Devahuti. You want to control the mind? This is what you have to do. Faithfully practice the yoga system. That is like yam and niyam, the rules and regulations. And then elevate, then that way we get elevated to the platform of pure devotional service. And then we, be, then we should begin chanting and hearing about Krishna. The yoga process is just simply the beginning, that's indirect. But the your purpose of the yoga process is to bring us to the platform we will take up chanting and hearing about the Lord. This is the idea. Okay? You want to control the mind, you have to come to that stage. Become absorbed in chanting and hearing. It's not that you can just do the yoga system, pran, you know, like Astanga yoga and so on, practice that. That way we'll get relief. All right, someone can read next text. Oh, someone read this one. It's attained by controlling the senses, either by yoga practice, following the rules and regu regulations, and practicing the sitting po um, postures, or by engaging directly in bhakti yoga, as recommended in the previous verse. Right, so there's two processes to develop this faith, to develop the faith. Faith is like the beginning of the devotional process. So Prabhupada's faith you can get faith by controlling the senses. How do we control the senses? Well, you can do the, follow the yoga process, the different rules like Patanjali Yoga. In the Yoga Sutras, he mentions, you know, Yam and Niyam, the different stages of Astanga Yoga, Yam Niyam Asan, Pranayam, right? And the idea of the Astanga Yoga is, will bring you to the stage of Samadhi, or before that, uh, da, uh, dharana, jhana, pra, oh, da, dharana, jhana, prachahara, prachahara, dharana, jhana, and samadhi, like that. Prachahara is the inter detachment from the external, prachahara, then dharana, internally detached, jhana, meditation on the Lord in the heart, and samadhi, mind is fixed in trance. So these meditational stages, that's the perfection of the Astanga Yoga. And then we're recommended to take up Bhakti Yoga, to begin hearing and chanting about the activities of the Lord. Go ahead. 
Read the next one. One may come to the standard of faithfulness by following the rules and regulations of the yoga system, and the same goal can be achieved simply by chanting and hearing about the transcendental activities of the Lord. Yeah. You can go through the rules and regulations of the yoga, you know, starting with the yam and the niyam and all this, and then the asana, the yoga, and then the pranayama, and then prajahara, like that, bit by bit, step by step. That will help you to develop faith and then become peaceful. Or you can simply take to bhakti yoga. You can simply start chanting and hearing. Because that's the goal, that's what you want to come to. So bhakti yoga, that's the direct process. If you go through the yoga system, that's the indirect process. Keep reading. The word cha is significant. Bhakti yoga is direct and the other process is indirect. But even if the indirect process is taken, there is no success unless one comes fully to the direct process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Yes, we saw something similar in the Bhagavad Gita when you were doing the yoga ladder. So you can go in the yoga ladder, you can go step by step from jnana, from karma yoga to jnana yoga to karma yoga to jnana yoga to jnana yoga and then bhakti or you can immediately take to bhakti Probably we give the example go on the lift don't go up the stairs go on the lift you go right to the top right yes so that's the direct process go ahead Maharaji, one more satyana means without duplicity. The impersonalists are full of duplicity. Sometimes they pretend to execute devotional service, but their ultimate idea is to become, become one with the Supreme. Right. So, where did we hear about this duplicity? Where is this mentioned in our Srimad Bhagavatam? Do you remember? In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's called cheating, the cheating propensity. Dharma projita kaitava, kaitava dharma, dharma projita kaitava, dharma projita kaitava, nirmatsara namsatam, nirmatsara namsatam. They're not envious. They give up, you should give up envy. If you're envious, then we won't be able to do bhakti yoga. We have to give up this cheating propensity. So mentioned here, without duplicity. Duplicity, you say one thing, but you want something else. They pretend to do devotional service, but they don't want, to, their, their idea is to merge, and become one with the Supreme. So this is duplicity, this is not the real approach, you understand? So this is rejected. This, okay, we'll read verses 7 and 8. Someone, let's see, let's go back to the text. Mm. Seven. What's that one? Six. Here's verse seven. Someone like to read? Regarding devotional service, one has to see every living entity equally, without enmity towards anyone, yet without intimate connection with anyone. One has to observe celibacy, be grave, and execute his eternal activities, offering the result to the Supreme Person of Godhead. Okay. Yes. So one should perform devotional service in this manner. We can see similar principles. This is like the yoga process, talking about these different things, the rules and regulations, see everyone equally, practice celibacy, be grave. All right. And then text number eight, someone read. For his income, a devotee should be satisfied 
uh, with the, uh, what he earns without wage difficulty. He should not eat more than what is necessary. He should live in a secluded place and always be throughout thoughtful, peaceful, friendly, compassionate, and self-realized. Mm. Okay, so these are the different rules and regulations we're supposed to follow in practicing the yoga system. Can you do it? Well, we do it in bhakti yoga. It's very similar. The same things are there in bhakti yoga. Okay, read 7 to 10. Kapila Muni offers further instructions to guide yoga practitioners according to the preliminary rules and regulations of yoga. Following these preliminary rules and regulations, namely yamas and niyamas, yama and niyam, yama is the things you, should, you shouldn't do and niyam is the things you should do, I think. Like that, just like we have uh, surrender to Krishna, right? Anukuyasya sankalpa. We should, the first principles of surrender accept everything favorable for devotional service and reject everything which is not favorable for devotional service. That is surrender. And here you see Astanga Yoga, Yama and Niyama. So the Yamas, the things we, should, we shouldn't do, and the Niyams, things we have to do. What, what should we not do? We shouldn't do meat, fish and eggs, intoxication, gambling, illicit sex. What should we do? We should chant Hare Krishna, we should read Srimad Bhagavatam, we should worship the deities, we should eat prasadam, these things. So these are the same things there in yoga. So described from verses 6 to 8, these principles purify the practitioner and prepares him for meditation on the super soul, a process that will be described in chapter 28. Right? We read verses 7 and 8, and the idea is to prepare ourselves for meditation on the super soul. Unless we're very pure in our heart and in our mind, we won't be able to meditate. We won't be able to fix the mind. So it's really important we prepare ourselves. Just like in Krishna consciousness, people come to Krishna consciousness, they don't get initiated immediately. They have to purify themselves first. They have to do devotional service for some time. Then, after some time, then they may get initiation. Okay, so we ask, what are the 18 qualities to be cultivated by a jnani described in verses 7 to 10? Do we, do we have those 18 qualities? Is it mentioned there? Verses 7 to 10. Let's have a look at the text. Okay, here's text 7. 18 qualities. So you can see the different qualities. Prabhupada explains celibacy means that we should, we can, we, you can associate with your wife, but you don't have illicit association. We should be grave. We shouldn't be joke, always joking around. We should be serious. At the same time, Prabhupada liked to humor, he liked to laugh. Prabhupada laughed a lot. Execute his external activities, offer the results to Krishna. Then eight, 
income, we should be satisfied, we shouldn't do a lot of black market and, you know, a lot of speculative business to get more money, and just accept what's it obtained honestly without too much endeavor. Don't eat more than what's necessary. Live in, in a secluded place means you should always live with devotees. Be thoughtful, peaceful, friendly, compassionate, self-realized, all these different things. Then text 9, one seeing power should be increased through knowledge of spirit and matter. And one should not unnecessarily identify himself with the body and thus become attached or attracted by bodily relationships. So these are the different qualities which are recommended for practicing the yoga system or for cultivating um, Cultivated by the jnani, right? Eighteen qualities. Go ahead, read this purport from text number four. Someone? The power of friendship is limited. Although one claims to be a friend, he cannot be a friend unlimitedly. There are an unlimited number of living entities and our resources are limited. Therefore, we cannot be of any real benefit to the people in general. The best service to the people in general is to awaken them to Krishna consciousness so that they may know that superior enjoyer, the supreme proprietor and the supreme friend is Krishna. Then this illusory dream of lording it over material nature will vanish. Yes. Suridam Sarva Bhutanam, right? Krishna says, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam, the best friend of all living entities. So there are many words for friend, you know, dosht, mitra, like that. But here Krishna has used the very best word, the very best friend. So Krishna is the very best friend. Why is he the best friend? Can you tell me why? Because he is the Supreme Father and he loves us. Okay. Any other reason? Don't we there in the living entity in the form of Paramatma? Yes. So what's he doing? He's our, he's our benefactor. He always wants good for us. Yes, he always wants good for us. He's our benefactor. Like, uh, we can go to him anytime we need. I mean, we, we, why we need a friend? We need a friend to talk to. A person whom we can talk to. Uh, talk to uh, whom we can talk anytime. So, oh, very nice. Are you talking to Krishna? Yeah, I try. I always, whenever, I mean, I know he's there for me every time. Oh, very good. Yes, you're very right. He's always there. I think that's one thing most important. You know, we have friends, but they come and go. You know, I had friends when I was at school. I had friends when I went to college. And then you grow up, you get a job, you have friends. And some people, they get married and they have different friends, you know. And then, so you know, you have children or stuff. You, and you get different friends. So, but there's one friend who's always with us, who we're not taking care of, but we, we tend to neglect him. He's the Krishna, the Lord who is in the heart. So, we want to know him. He's a, he's the real friend. And he, he's guiding us, he's directing us how to get out of this world, how to become Krishna conscious. So this is the real friendship that we want. If we take the guidance of Krishna, then we'll do the right way. It's very important. We have to make decisions at different times. We have to decide what to do and should I go there, should I do this. So many decisions are there in life. 
And Krishna is there in the heart and he can guide us, he can help us to make the right decision. So we have to con constantly uh, take shelter of Krishna and pray to him and count, take counseling, take guidance from him. We know he's, he's the Upadrashta and Anumanta, he's the overseer, he's the permitter. Maharaj, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, in the first line it says the power of friendship is limited. Uh, so amongst Vaishnavas or devotees, if we have friendship with a devotee, is that also limited? Friendship with a devotee is limited. Yes. Well, of course, yeah, it's going to be limited. It's going to be limited because we are limited. We, we ourselves are limited, so we, we make friendships with devotees, but de devotees, you know, they come and go, they move around, their situation changes, we're not always able to be with them and to have their association. So the power of friendship is very limited in the material world. So we have friends with devotees. I had so many friends, devotees, but where are they now? You know, they, we lose them in the course of time. And some, some, some people go away and some people change their ashram and you don't get contact with them anymore. And some of them even die, you know. And so we lose that kind of friendship. So in this way the power of friendship is limited, limited to our lifespan in the material body. Even if you can associate for that lifespan, it's limited. But if we make friendship with Krishna, that is the best friendship, that he is always with us. Thank you Maharaj. In the book, the Bhakti, the Art of Eternal Love, in the introduction, it mentions a about uh, relationships and each relationship has a beginning, time span and end. But if everyone connects back to the source, meaning if everyone in that relationship connects back to Krishna, those relationships become eternal. How, how can we understand that point? Then? Well, that's a transcendental relationship. The, other, the relationships which are beginning and have an end, those are material relationships. They're relationships more based with the body because of the body, because of our physical situation. But we have, at the same time, we have a very transcendental relationship with Lord Krishna, who is accompanying us. He's accompanying us everywhere, at birth after birth, right? In the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, many, many births both you and I have had. I can remember all of them, but you cannot. So Krishna has been with us. He, Krishna knows our past. He's been with us through all the different species of life. We don't remember, but Krishna can remember. Krishna knows everything about us, we don't. Our knowledge is limited. But if we really take shelter of Krishna, then Krishna can really guide us. He can give us the best counseling, the best guidance. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, may I ask one thing? Yes. Maharaj, you, you mentioned just now that if we take the shelter of uh, the lotus feet of the Lord, then we can get the best counselling and the guidance from the Supreme Lord situated in our heart. Yes. So actually how to, how, how to uh, apply in our life actually, how to apply or implement or how to learn, learn this concept so that we always follow it? Well, it begins with 
cultivating the relationship with the spiritual master because the spiritual master is the external manifestation of the super soul. We should see the spiritual teacher in that way as the, the external manifestation of the super soul. And we should approach, approach him and cultivate the, a relationship with him, take guidance from him. And then under his direction, then we all want to go to Krishna. We want to awaken our Krishna consciousness. What's the problem mentioned here? The illusory dream of lording it over material nature will vanish. We have that problem that we're, we're always thinking about how to exploit and enjoy the resources of the material nature. But by surrendering to Krishna, then we can actually come to the proper consciousness. Recognizing that it's Krishna who's the proprietor, and he's the enjoyer, and he's our friend. And we have to relate to him as a friend. We have to understand that he's with us all the time and he knows us very well, better than we know ourselves. So we should take help from him, we should submit ourselves to him by devotional service, simply by devotional service, by hearing and chanting the glories of Krishna. And in that way we become more conscious of Krishna and Krishna will give us more and more guidance, more and more shelter. Yeah, Maharaj, you mentioned that we have to, at the first step, we have to cultivate the relationship with the spiritual master. Now, the first step to cultivate this uh, relationship with the spiritual master, it, it actually happens, it begins with at, at some kind of a formal level. Now, how to bring that kind of a, a relationship, that juicy relationship or the relationship which we, everybody should basically endeavor for or long for, how to basically get into that realm of relationship? Well, by hearing, by hearing the classes, by hearing the lectures of the spiritual master and by inquiring from him. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. That is the process of, by hearing, tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya, these things. So, surrendering, submitting ourselves to the spiritual master, then inquiring from him and rendering service. That is how we develop the friendship with the spiritual teacher. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, well, go ahead. Verse number... Yes? Huh? Uh, f f forgive me. Um, uh, this is very good, that's pronounced. Uh, Maharaj, I... With due respect, I just wanted to um, sort of pass on a comment to my observation, which is that um, whilst it's very interesting to hear people's different questions and queries, but sometimes, uh, at least for a group of us, a majority uh, of us, it appears to somehow break the continuity of uh, what's being actually uh, discussed. So I just wanted to express this as a minor uh, point uh, for okay. your consideration. All right. So, uh, okay, maybe we can make time for questions. And I, I personally think it's uh, sometimes it it's breaks the monotony for people if they have to hear sit just sit and hear a lecture, hear me speak. That, that sometimes it's. It's good, you know, I think the questions are quite relevant. The questions which have been brought up are pretty much in relation to the topic. Sure. I just wanted to share my opinion, that's all. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Thank you. All right, verse number 11. A liberated soul realizes the super soul. The super soul's characteristics are described. Prabhupada describes the awareness of a liberated soul. Would someone read? A pure 
devotee can see the presence of the supreme personality of godhead in everything materially manifested he is present there only as an as a reflection but a pure devotee can realize that in the darkness of material illusion the only light is the supreme lord who is its support okay so this is the awareness of the liberated soul you can see the presence of Krishna everywhere. Right? That's generally how we view the Uttama Adhikari, that he's seeing, he's able to see Krishna there and, and everywhere and everything. Prahlad Maharaj was asked by his father, where is your God? Is he in here? And of course Prahlad Maharaj, he said, yes, he's in there, he's in the pillar. Because Prahlad is Uttama, so he sees God everywhere. And so, <laughs> that was Lord Nishringadev came out of the pillar and met Haranyakashipu. So, this is the vision of the liberated souls, that they see the, the Lord everywhere. Text 11. The presence of the soul and the super soul. Text number 12 describes. Someone read? The presence of the super soul, Supreme Lord. Can be realized just as the sun is realized first as the reflection on water and again as a second reflection on the wall of the room, although the sun itself is situated in the sky. All right, thank you, Prabhu. So, the presence of the Lord, like the sun. So, we had that in the very first verse, right? The, re the reflection on water. That the sun is in the sky, the reflection on water, the water may be disturbed, the sun's not disturbed. So similarly here, the sun is reflected, the presence of the Supreme Lord is realized first as a reflection on water. The sun itself is in the sky. So the same way the Lord is reflected, every, he's seen everywhere. It's the, ref the reflection. Pure devotee sees this, sees in this way, he sees how the Lord is ever in, every in everything, everywhere. In the same way the Supreme Lord's in the spiritual world, but at the same time he's everywhere in this material world. Just like the sun is reflected everywhere. So the Lord resides in Goloka Vrindavan, but at the same time He's everywhere in everything. He's in the atoms even. So this is the vision. Prabhupada explains, the example given herewith is perfect. The sun is situated in the sky, far, far away from the surface of the earth, but its reflection can be seen in a pot of water in a corner of a room. The room is dark and the sun is far away in the sky, but the sun's reflection on the water illuminates the darkness of the room. Text 13. Someone read? The self-realized yes. soul is thus reflected first in the threefold ego and then in the body, senses and mind. So the threefold ego, we have ego in goodness, passion and ignorance. Self-realized soul is reflected and then in the body, senses and mind. And we're told about Satya Drik. With that correct vision, one can engage everything in the service of the Lord. Prabhupada in the purport gives the example of the rose. The correct vision is to understand everything belongs to Krishna. Prabhupada talks about the rose. The rose is very beautiful, 
So in the material world, the man may take the flower and may give it to his girlfriend or his wife for their pleasure, for their enjoyment. But the devotee sees the flower, he will take the flower and he will give it to Krishna. He will offer it to Krishna because he understands everything is for the service of Krishna. So that is the correct vision. That is called satyadrik, the correct vision. To understand everything belongs to Krishna and is meant for his service. So self-realized soul, he, he understands that. He can understand this. Therefore, he will use his body, mind and words or senses in the service of Krishna. There's the verse, Iha yashya hare dashye karmana manasagira nikilaspapi avastas tu jivan mukta sauchate. Jivan mukta sauchate. He's a, a liberated soul. Even though he is in the material world, he appears to be in the material world, he's actually a liberated soul. That is the point. Oh, then text 14. Someone read. Arthur a devotee a, appears to be merged in the five material elements, the object of material enjoyment, the material senses, and the material mind and intelligence. He is understood to be awake and to be freed from the false ego. Thank you, Prabhu. So it appears like the devotees in the material world. He's among all the objects of the material world, the material energies all around him. But he, is, he can be awake. He can be free from false ego. How does he do it? How, because he's a devotee. He's in Krishna consciousness. So he sees everything not for his own enjoyment, but for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. That is the difference. So that is the stage of wakefulness, to see everything in relation to Krishna. He's understood to be awake. Three different stages are going to be, first wakefulness, and then sleep and deep sleep, right? So the devotee is awake. He sees everything at the proper mood in relation to Krishna. Go ahead, text 15. Read. The living, the living entity can vividly feel his existence as the seer, but because of the disappearance of the ego during the state of deep sleep, he falsely takes himself to be lost, like a man who has lost his fortune and feels distressed, thinking himself to be lost. Mm, yes. So, sometimes it happens like that. Uh, a man may have a lot of money and he loses his money and he thinks, oh, my life is finished, now I've lost everything. They feel life is no longer worth living. They've only lost the money, but they're so attached to the money, they feel that they've lost everything. Their life is no longer worthwhile living. There was a case, we had one man, it was in Hong Kong. He was a, a businessman and he made a lot of toys and he had a big shipment It went off to America. But when it got to America, the whole shipment got put, got, got destroyed. Because when it came to America, the customs found out that there was some chemical in the paint which had been used on the toys, and this chemical was harmful to people. So they ordered all the toys had to be destroyed. So the man lost all of his money, so he committed suicide. Because he'd lost all his business failed, he had no money anymore, he thought no point to live, he just killed himself. And so people are like that. They lose their fortune, they think, I'm, now I'm lost, I've lost everything. Or sometimes it's a man's wife, 
Sometimes a man loses his wife and he thinks, now my life is no worth, not worth anymore, I've lost my wife, she's gone away, left me. The person doesn't, have, doesn't want to live anymore. Like that material attachments, right? So this is like the stage of deep sleep. So the living entity feels his existence. It's like the stage of deep sleep. He falsely takes himself to be lost. Oh, I've lost everything. All the things, whatever I valued, I attached to, I lost it. So life is not worth anything. So he's lost everything. He loses even his ego. So he... he he wants to give up his life. Next one, take 16. When by nature, uh, when by nature understanding, one can realize his individuality, individuality, then the situation he accepts under the false ego becomes, became, becomes manifest to him. Yeah, when by mature, by mature understanding, we can realize his individuality. But then the situation he accepts under false ego becomes manifest to him. So he accepts the situation by false ego. So this is sleep. Can realize his individuality. Okay? From Burijan Prabhu's unveiling his lotus feet. He's written about this. Can you read this, Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask a question? Don't mind. I don't mind, yeah. Thank you. Maharaj, this third line in text number 16, there is no distinction between the knower, knowable and knowledge. So could you elaborate on this line? Uh, knower is, God, is the Lord. There is no di differentiation between no distinction between the knower, the knowable, and the object of knowing, object of knowledge, is it? Yeah, so could you just uh, tell me what... Um, well, what that, on that's the impersonalist view. Okay. That they see everything as one. They don't see any individuality. The impersonalist. You know, it's all one, we're all one. That's what's okay. being described. Okay? Thank you, mm -hmm. Yes, Thank you. Okay, who was reading for us? Unveiling his lotus feet? Yes. Thus, Srila Prabhupada has compared a person's walking, waking life to his Krishna consciousness, his dream lives, one after another, to his succession of illusory identities caused by bodily identification. And his experience of deep sleep in which he loses his awareness of his individual identity to merging with the Lord's impersonal effulgence. Okay, yes. Srila Prabhupada compares a person's waking life to Krishna consciousness, right? So that was text 14 there. His dream lives, his dream li his dream His, his dream lives one after another, his dream lives, his dream lives one after another to his succession of illusory identities caused by bodily identification. And so that's sleeping. And his dependence on deep sleep in which he loses his awareness of his individual identity to merging with the Lord's impersonal effulgence. So, in the, the deep sleep, the impersonalism, no, no awareness of his individual identity, just simply wants to merge into the oneness of the Lord's existence, the Brahman, Brahmajoyti, giving up his individual identity. Oh. 
Maharaj. Yes. Uh, may I just uh, confirm one statement? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned text number 14 is the state of wakefulness, which is basically the devotional service. Text number 15 is basically sleep state, uh, where uh, the person is losing the identity. And uh, text number 16 is the deep sleep state, which basically talks about merging in the Brahm Jyoti. No, I didn't say exactly like that, Prabhu. I'd have to go back to the text. Let me see. Okay, here. Okay, there's the example of the rose. That's uh, text 13. What, text 14, we said text 14 is understood to be awake. So that's wakefulness is being described there in text 14. Mm -hmm. This is individual. <laughs> This is individuality. It, it is so even in this material existence, when the living entity apparently merges in matter. Its gross body is made up of five elements, a subtle body, etc., contaminated consciousness, five active senses, and so on. In this way, he merges in matter. But even when merged in the 24 elements of matter, he can keep his individuality as the eternal servitor of the Lord. Right? I quoted the verse for you, that he can be a liberated soul even in the material world. So Prabhupada said, either in the spiritual nature or in the material nature, such a service, such a servitor is to be considered a liberated soul. That is the explanation of the authorities, and it is confirmed in this verse. So that is wakefulness, right? And then here, text 15, we have uh, the living entity vividly feels his existence as a seer. Like a man who has lost his fortune feels distressed. A person who has lost a great sum of money may think that he is lost but actually is not lost. Only his money is lost. But due to his absorption in the money or identification, with, he thinks that he is lost. Similarly, when we falsely identify with matter as our field of activities, we think that we are lost, although actually we are not. As soon as a person is awakened, to the pure knowledge of understanding that he is an eternal servant of Krishna, his own real position is revived. A living entity can never be lost. When one forgets his identity in deep sleep, he becomes absorbed in dreams. And he may think himself a different person, or may think himself lost, but actually his identity is intent. This concept of being lost is due to false ego and it continues as long as one is not awakened to the sense of his existence as an eternal servitor of the Lord. The Mayavadi philosopher's concept of becoming one with the Supreme Lord is another symptom of being lost in false ego. Right? So that is deep sleep. Text 15. Yes, Maharaj. Text 16. When by na material nature one can realize his individuality, then the situation he accepts under false ego becomes manifest to him. The Mayavadi philosopher's position is that the ultimate issue, the individual, is lost. Everything becomes one, and there is no distinction between the knower, the knowable, and knowledge. But by minute analysis, we can see that this is not correct. Individuality is never lost. Even when one thinks that the three different principles, namely knower, knowable, and knowledge, are amalgamated are merged into one. 
The very concept that the three merge into one is another form of knowledge. And since the per perceiver of the knowledge still exists, how can one say that the knower, the knower, knowledge, noble, have become one? The individual soul who is perceived, who is perceiving this knowledge, still remains an individual. Prabhupada is defeating their philosophy by this purport. You see, he's explaining that there's no question of losing everything. But in material existence, but in material existence and in spiritual existence, the individuality continues. Okay, going ahead, what Prabhupada says, when one clearly understands one's constitutional position, everything becomes manifest. False egoistic acceptance of things conditions one, whereas acceptance of things as they are makes one liberated. The example given in the previous verse is applicable here. Due to absorption of one's identity in his money, when the money is lost, he thinks that he is also lost. But actually he is not identical with the money, nor does the money belong to him. When the actual situation is revealed, we understand the money does not belong to any individual person or living entity, nor is it produced by man. So my understanding is that this six, 15 and 16 are both describing that deep, that deep sleep. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, then we're going ahead. Text 17 begins Devahuti's questions. We have... Oh. Okay, we don't, we don't need that. Devahuti's questions, text 17 to 20. Yeah, someone read the questions. Maya, Maya, dear Brahmana, does material nature ever give release to the spirit soul? Since one is attracted to the other e eternally, how is their separation possible? How can there be freedom for the soul as long as material nature acts on him and binds him? Even if the great fear of bondage is avoided by mental speculation and inquiry into the fundamental principles, it may still appear again, since its cause has not ceased. It's a very interesting question put by Devahuti, right? <laughs> One is attracted to material nature ever give release to the soul? Do you have a body without a soul? Impossible, right? You have to have the soul with the body. So how can there be freedom from the soul as long as material nature acts and binds them? Even if the fear of bondage is avoided by mental speculation, it may still appear again. Its cause has not ceased. The fear of bondage means entanglement in the material world. So, the cause has not ceased. What's the cause of our entanglement? Attachment. So we're going to hear how to deal with this. Yes? Someone read? Examine, examine the terms each adversary in relation to material bondage. Verse 20. Two kinds of propensities arise in the living entity. One propensity is Dikha, which means desire to lord it over material nature or to be as great as the Supreme Lord. Everyone desires to be the greatest personality in this material world. Vesha means envy. When one becomes envious of Krishna, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one thinks, why should Krishna be 
Yeah, keep reading. These two items, desire to be the Lord and envy of the Lord, are the beginning cause of material bondage. As long as the philosopher, conventionist, or poetic has some desire to be supreme, to be everything, or to deny the existence of God, the cause remains, and there is no question of taking the right. Mm. It's a bit more. An honest man is not afraid of the police. Shiddha's Baron comments on this in this connection that by associating with material nature alone, one does not become conditioned. Conditioned life begins only after one is infected by the mode of material nature. If someone is in contact with the police department, that does not mean that he is a criminal. As long as one does not commit criminal acts, even though there is a police department, is not funny. Yes? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So that's Prabhupada's comments on this. And Sridhar Swami's comment. <laughs> we shouldn't think that just because someone's in the material world, just because someone's in the material world that they must be conditioned souls. Just like sometimes people see devotees, they see devotees and they see us distributing books and they think, oh, we're just out there making money, we just want to get money. You know, they, they, they see us like that. They see us as being very materialistic sometimes. But they don't understand that our motive is to actually give them Krishna consciousness. We're trying to make people aware of Krishna consciousness. We're not worried about the. We have a very different consciousness from the ordinary materialist, the ordinary karmi. We may be in the material world, but it doesn't mean we're identifying with the world. So Sridhar Swami's example is very nice. Someone may be in contact with the police department, but it doesn't mean he's a criminal. He didn't do any crime. In the same way, devotee doesn't do any crime. He's simply engaging in Krishna's service. So he's not like the ordinary materialistic people who are doing all sinful activities. The devotee's sinless because he's active in Krishna consciousness. All right. So how can we develop this devotional mood, this tivrena, tivraya bhakti charam, intense bhakti for a long time? Lord Kapila told Devahuti she should practice intense bhakti for a long time in order to help to get this, get free from this material energy. And it should be inimita nimitena, without desire for fruitive results. And it should be swadharm, swadharmen atmala mana by executing prescribed duties with a pure mind, shruta samritaya, nourished by hearing about me, hearing about Lord Kapila, jnanena drishta tadvena, with perfect knowledge and visualize, and visualizing the absolute truth, vairagyena baliyasa, strong detachment, Tapo yuktena, austerity. Yogena, by yoga, controlling the mind and senses. Tivrain atma sanadina, self absorption. So many wonderful qualities that are be being described. We want to develop the mood. We want to be very serious in our devotional service. And so these are some of the qualities, which, these are qualities we want to develop. It's a challenge, it's not such a small thing, very challenging things. Const constantly controlling the mind, austerity, detachment, at the same time doing prescribed duty, no desire for fruitive results, 
You don't want anything for yourself, right? So this is all required. Yeah, go ahead, read the next text. One can be liberated from all adverse circumstances. Can you read the title? Can you read the title? How long one develops serious devotional service? How what? How can one develop serious devotional service? Text 21. One can be liberated from all adverse circumstances simply by serious engaging in devotional service. How this devotional service develops and becomes mature is explained here. Mm. can be liberated from all adverse conditions. The material world is adverse conditions. But if we do devotional service, we'll become detached from it. This serious devotional service can develop by hearing for long periods of time. One should associate with the devotees and hear from them about the Lord's transcendental appearance, activities, disappearance, instructions, etc. One must hear these scriptures repeatedly from reliable sources in order to become fixed in serious devotional service. Conclusion through engagement in such devotional service, one becomes free from all contaminations of Maya. Mm. How can one estimate his development in Krishna consciousness? Text 22. It is said that development of Krishna consciousness is exhibited by proportionate material detachment or vairagya. If one does not separate himself from material enjoyment, it is to be understood that he is not advancing in Krishna consciousness. Renunciation in Krishna consciousness is so strong that it cannot be deviated by any attractive illusion. So it's important for us to understand how we're developing in Krishna consciousness. People often ask us, how do I know I'm making advancement? So here Prabhupada is giving us some guidelines. He says that the, the advancement will be understood by material detachment we've cultivated. There should be material detachment. We have to give up material enjoyment. That is the price we have to pay to advance in Krishna consciousness. So, requires renunciation. This is it. We want to advance, we have to detach from material enjoyment. Yes? Read. Analyze. Analyze. Analyze the two main diseases of material contamination. Text 23. Thus his main disease, thus his main diseases are that he wants to be one with the Supreme Law, or he wants to become the Lord of the material nature. The Karmis tries to utilize the resources of material nature and thus become its Lord and enjoy sense gratification and the Gyanis, the self who become, who have become frustrated in enjoying the material resources, wants to become one with the Supreme Person of Godhead and merge into the impersonal effulgence. Yes. So the main disease. We were hearing earlier, today we've been hearing, who is the proprietor? Who is actually the enjoyer? So we, we have that disease 
that we are thinking we are the proprietor, we are the enjoyer. We're trying to steal Krishna's resources, Krishna's energy, we're trying to take it for our own self. Yes? All right, someone else can read? Answer to Devadhi's question in verse 20, 24 to 26. What Prakriti was... cannot harm an enlightened soul. Yeah, Prakriti cannot harm an enlightened soul. Even if the great fear of bondage is avoided by mental speculation and inquiry into the fundamental principles, it may still appear again since it causes, since his cause has not ceased. So Deva, that was Devahuti's point, that the cause is the material energy, and material energy is still there. And so, you know, we're still, if the material energy is there, we're still going to get problems. And the fear of the become, of bondage is still going to be there. How to get rid of it? Yeah, go ahead. By discovering the faultiness of his desiring to lord it over material nature, and by therefore giving it up, the living entity becomes independent and stands in his own glory. All right. So, how to give it up? How do we give up the desire to lord over material nature? By fixed up in devotional service. Yes, by simply surrendering to Krishna and taking up devotional service. That is real independence. Our independence is there, that we surrender to Krishna. That is proper use of our independence. The foolish karmi thinks, oh, I'm independent, I can do what I like. Are they doing what they like? Is a materialist actually independent? Yes and no. What do you mean? No. Yes and no they do they do um, according to their to their freedom of choice. According to what? Their freedom of choice. They can choose to be this or that. But their freedom, their freedom of choice is either to surrender to Krishna or not. That is their freedom of choice. Either they're going to serve Krishna or they're going to serve Maya. That is their choice. Once they surrender to Maya, then they're controlled. And the devotee, he surrenders to Krishna. He's also controlled by the superior energy. But that is proper use of independence. The materialists, they don't know how to use their independence. They, may, they surrender to Maya and they suffer. Go ahead. Such a person of discrimination is like an awakened person who is not affected by a dream. Right. If you have, if sometimes you were in a dream, you're very disturbed. Oh, a tiger is coming to eat me. But if a person's awake, you don't worry about it. Yeah? Because Vidata Tatavasya, he knows the absolute truth or the element. Yunjato Mai Manasam, he has fixed his mind on me. Atma mm. Ramasya, he rejoices in the self. Yes. All right, so that's a pure devotee. And then in the text 27, we hear about mixed devotees. There's pure devotees and mixed devotees. Prabhupada explains to us what is a mixed devotee. Read. Analyze the distinction between pure devotees and mixed devotees. Text 27. A mixed devotee engages in devotional service for a spiritual benefit of being eternally engaged in the transcendental abode of the Lord in full bliss and knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a mixed devotee. Is it surprising to you? He does devotional service for spiritual benefit. It's not pure devotion. Why? But 
Maharaj, pure devotion and spiritual benefit is same here. It appeals appears to be same. Hmm. Mm? Here in this case, Maharaj, spiritual benefit means that he is uh, looking for his benefit only. He is not looking for benefit of Krishna. That's right. It's for his benefit. He's doing spiritual. He's doing devotional service for his benefit. He wants to enjoy the bliss and the knowledge. <laughs> right? He's enjoying the spiritual benefit for his pleasure, not for Krishna. That's a mixed devotee. Right? Read more. In material existence, when a devotee is not completely purified, he accepts material benefit from the Lord in the form of relief from material miseries, material gain, advancement in knowledge of the relationship between the Supreme Person of Godhead and the living entity, knowledge, as to real nature of the Supreme Lord. So he accepts material benefit from Krishna. This is... Devotee, we're not completely purified, we can accept these kind of benefits. Relief from the miseries, yeah, we all want, we would like that, we all want that. Material gain, definitely some people, and we, we, we read about the four kinds of people who surrender to Krishna, different reasons they come, right? Chatur Vida Vijantimam Jnana Sukriti no Arjuna, Arto Jignasur Arta Arti Jnani Cha Bharat Arshaba. So people surrender, they're not pure devotees, but they've, they, they have Sukriti, they come to Krishna and they enjoy material benefit. So gradually they go on to become pure devotees. They just have to remain in Krishna consciousness and gradually they will become purified. Read. When a person is transcendental to these conditions, he is called a pure devotee. He does not engage himself in the service of the Lord for any material benefit or for understanding of the Supreme Lord. His one interest is that he loves the Supreme Person of Godhead and engage, and he spontaneously engages in satisfying him. Hmm. So this is the pure devotee. His only motive is to love Krishna, please Krishna. Read. Into 30, perfection of yoga. A devotee's attention is concentrated only upon the eternal loving service of the Lord, and therefore the power of death has no influence over him. In such a devotion state, a perfect yogi can attain the status of immortal knowledge and bliss. Jai. And so, death, the power of death has no influence over him. Does it mean he's not going to die? Of course, he's still going to die. But he's not going to be so much worried about it because he understands what's happening. He understands death is just simply the change of body. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I ask a question? All right. Uh, regarding this, the previous uh, verse, mentions about pure devotees. So, does a pure devotee only have spiritual desire? Uh, to please Krishna, or does he have, not have any desire, so he's just happy to go along with whatever Krishna's plan is? Well, devotees do have desire. Pure devotees, you cannot be desireless. Desireless is the, uh, you know, it's not the natural condition. So it's the nature of every living entity to have desire, but we want to purify the desire. So the pure devotee has pure desires. His desire is simply for the service of Krishna. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches us the mood of the pure devotee. The Natanamna Janamna Sundarim, right? He doesn't want profit, adoration, distinction. He simply wants devotional service, birth after birth. So that is the mood of the pure devotee. He's, he doesn't say, I want to go back to Godhead. He would say, whatever Krishna wants, wherever Krishna puts me, I'll serve Krishna there. Right? Thank you, Maharaj. So just a quick uh, understanding. So if a pure devotee, let's say, wants to build a temple for the Lord, uh, so that's one of his desires. 
So for him to pursue that is perfectly in order with pure devotion. Yes. Yes. Pure devotion. That's proper use of his wealth. If he has wealth, he can use it to build a temple. Yes. Why not? Prabhupada talks in one purport, he talks about it, that the devotee will build a temple for Krishna and the materialist will build a skyscraper for his sense gratification. So that's the difference between the, the, the devotee and the non-devotee. Yeah, proper use of our wealth for the service of Krishna. We build a nice temple for Krishna. Yes? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions on this chapter? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, with your kind permission, may I ask? Yes, please, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, you mentioned in text number 13, uh, the threefold ego. You mentioned that threefold ego refers to the ego in the mode of uh, ignorance, passion, and goodness, mode of uh, three modes. So, how to understand ego in the three modes? Because I believe that ego is a manifestation of the mode of ignorance. Because primarily when one is in ignorance, he feels that he is the doer. So, how to understand the manifestation of ego in the three modes, though it was also covered earlier, but somehow I could not understand in the deep sense, actually. Well, we understand the nature of the modes, so that ego, that ego, the desire, ego of thinking, thinking ourselves to be the proprietor or the doer of something, we, we can think of it in, in different ways and think of it in terms of goodness, passion and ignorance. It's not all just ignorance. The false ego, the false ego, the illusion of being identifying oneself as a doer or the proprietor, it can also be, in, you know, it can be in, in, in the sense of goodness, it could be in the sense of passion, it can be in the ignorance. Everything depends on the attitude. So, what is the particular attitude there in that case? So, how is one going to utilize? everything. What is his motivation in doing things? Is it to harm others? Or is it for his own name and fame? Or is it for his purification? The oh, different, different motives are there, even in the case of ego. So I think if I understood uh, correctly, uh, you mentioned that uh, the ego in the mode of ignorance basically uh, has some sense of harming others and in the mode of passion to work in the uh, work in the attitude to get more name and fame and in the mode of goodness basically for one's own purification yes and and that's very that's pretty much how it's explained in relation to devotion in the modes of nature as we go on you'll see next week about devotion in the modes of nature, that we can do devotion also in goodness, passion and ignorance. You know, generally we think devotion is all, you know, transcendental, but far from it. Our devotion can also be influenced by the modes of nature. The modes of nature influence everything. Depends on, everything depends on that particular attitude of the devotee, of the of the performer, of the the individual. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. And uh, the uh, incarnation of Kapil Muni is he the principal incarnation of Satyoga, or there are other incarnations like Yagna or any other which you would like to mention? Because in the incarnations chapter, there were. Uh, the principal incarnation of Satyu, I was not able to understand completely. Yeah, he's not Yuga Avatar. He's not a Yuga Avatar? No, he's a Lila Avatar. Lila Avatar. So, for Satyu, which is the principal incarnation, Maharaj? Uh, yes, like that. There are different names. You can look in chapter uh, Canto 11 where uh, Karabhijana Muni is talking to Nimi Raj. 
Karabhajana Muni asked Nimira, uh, Nimiraja asked Karabhajana Muni about the Lord's incarnations in each age, and he describes about the Lord's incarnations in each of the yugas and such a yuga. There's several names mentioned. Okay, in Satyuga Mirror, there are many names mentioned which are principal incarnations of the Lord. Which are the Yuga Avatar, the, the names of the different names for the Yuga Avatar. Okay. For the Yuga Avatar. Okay, Actually, today is the day of the, uh, the Mela at Ganga Sagar, and Ganga Sagar is where Kapila Muni's ashram is. Yes, Maharaj taking place today. I don't know if it's going on today with the COVID, but probably I'm sure there must be some people there. Yeah. It's a big event. Usually every year many people go. So Kapila Muni's ashram is there at Ganga Saga. Okay, any other questions? Maharaj, will it be possible for you to share the document like, uh, and Dineshwar Prabhuji also mentioned regarding the document which mentioned about uh, some uh, research done on sound which basically uh, gives some facts about bondage, material bondage or some research paper you were mentioning during the beginning of the yes. class. Yes, yes I have that, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to Padma Sundari Maharaj, she can forward it to you. She's not very well just now, maybe. She's in Chennai just now and she's getting treatment in the hospital. She's got fever. She's got a fever. She said she's not got COVID. She was tested negative for COVID. So she's not got COVID, but uh, she's got to get some IV drips or something because she's dehydrated a lot with her fever. And so she's not in good health. May the Supreme Lord give her protection of the health. May I pray to the Supreme Lord Maharaj. Yes. Yes. So I'll forward to her and uh, that we and that she'll send to all of you. Or I'll give it to Annie Ruda Prabhu. He must have everybody's contact. That would might, might be better. I'll give it to Annie Ruda Prabhu and he can forward to all of you. It's not yes, a big it's not a big document. It's a small thing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, any other question? Uh, hi Krishna Maharaj, I just have two quick questions. Yeah? Uh, text 5 mentions about prolific consciousness. So in the spiritual world, we have pure consciousness. So does that change in consciousness take place when we reject Krishna or look away from Krishna and fall to this material nature? Is that when the change takes place from pure consciousness to polluted consciousness? Oh, yes, exactly. As soon as you turn away from Krishna, immediately, just like electricity, you put the light on, you put, or you put the light out, immediately the light goes out, right? Immediately the darkness comes. Immediately there's no Krishna consciousness, immediately you're in Maya. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Just a second question. Uh, we were speaking about faith is the beginning of the devotional process. Uh, so as one establishes faith and then moves on, um, at some point in time, uh, you know, something happens within that living entity, uh, you know, they, they have a bad experience or develop a certain desire and it's not fulfilled, so they then kind of lose faith. So how do we re-establish that, that faith? How do we re-establish that faith? Well, you have to get good association. The good association is mainly what I see, what really helps people the most. We've seen in our Krishna consciousness movement that sometimes some very valuable devotees had difficulties and they lost faith. How did they manage to stay back? One way is by very strong good association. Jayadweda Swami himself described that uh, at one point in the movement, very early in the movement, there was really a lot of difficulties and some leaders of the movement were, you know, they were preaching that Prabhupada is God or something like this and there was real problems in them. And he said he took shelter of the nectar of devotion 
and he simply read the nectar of devotion and he got completely convinced and his faith was became much he, he, he was you know he was having you know a little bit difficulty with his faith but because of the situation and all the turmoil and all the agitation among very senior leading people and, and but when he took shelter of nectar of devotion then he felt his faith was strong and he felt that saved him kept him in krishna consciousness reading Prabhupada's book, Nectar of Devotion. You could read any book, it could be any other book, it could be, you know. But I know Bhakti Charu Swami also, he, he, he came to Krishna consciousness after reading Nectar of Devotion. It convinced him he had to join the movement. He read that book. So it's a very, very powerful book. And Prabhupada describes it's the handbook for devotees. But I've seen other people, they, they just got very, very good association. They got a lot of mercy from a very senior, very powerful preacher, and he could convince them and keep them in Krishna consciousness, or bring them back into Krishna consciousness, restore their faith, they, you know, their faith had been challenged by disappointments and different leaders dropping away from Krishna consciousness. But somebody else who was very strong, he, he could convince them and bring them in, keep them alive. All right, Prabhu? Thank you for your, thank you, Maharaj, for the invaluable guidance information. Thank you. Yes, any other questions there? Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned about uh, the devotee handbook I missed. Which one is the devotee handbook? Nectar of Devotion. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Yes? Someone else had a hand up? No? Okay. So then we'll finish here today. So I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Jai. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Recording stopped. Hare Krishna Prabhu.